Thanks very much, guys. So the goal of this talk is to look at the sideline assessment when you have that kind of acute injury. We talked a little bit with Dr. O'Brien in terms of some of the things that we have, and I'm going to kind of walk you through. You've heard now two or three times the idea of using the SCAT-3, and we're going to go through that. And actually, you guys all have that in your handouts. You have a SCAT-3 and a child SCAT-3, what we use to evaluate this. Uh, for myself and Dr. Corrado, uh, Dr. Corrado is a head team physician at Northeastern University, uh, and I'm a team physician there and at UMass Boston. So we're seeing Division One, Division Three athletes uh, in all sports, uh, soccer and hockey primarily, where we see a lot of these. Uh, and, and so going through some sort of evidence-based approach to this assessment, and a lot of times we're standing on the shoulders of our athletic trainers uh, in terms of uh, keeping this on a regular uh, aspect and keeping it formal, but it, it, it's certainly a helpful thing. So just a, an introduction to what we see sometimes. So those are the easy ones, right? Those are the ones where you don't need a formal, evidence-based education system of how you're going to evaluate a concussion on the sidelines. That's not that common. If you have a loss of consciousness, if they've come over and they're confused, if they're going to the other sideline to ask teammates their questions, then we have uh, an obvious concussion. If they need help getting off the field, if you're picking them off the ice or picking them off the grass, then obviously uh, that's, that's not a, a difficult thing. But a lot of times it's not that easy. Uh, sometimes the symptoms are delayed. Sometimes they don't notice it. Sometimes they will inaccurately report them. And we think of students inaccurately reporting their symptoms because they're trying to hide them, because they, they want to keep on playing. And sometimes that's true. But there's also a huge aspect of them inaccurately reporting their symptoms because they don't know it. There were a number of studies that looked at students not reporting their concussions at a, a schools in Kansas. And of the people who didn't report their concussions, a great majority said, well, I don't really know that it was that big of a deal. Or they may not even notice it all, all the time. Anybody who sees concussion, I'm sure you hear the story all the time of, well, you know, I got hit and then I kept playing the game and then Saturday I was a little rough and then Sunday I went to a friend's house and then Monday school started and that's when it hit me. That's when I started to notice something was wrong. So a lot of times they may be inaccurately reporting their symptoms, either because they don't know the significance or they don't even really know that they're feeling them yet. Or... If they're truly having brain dysfunction, maybe they're not even able to realize that they're having those symptoms. Maybe they're not even with it enough to notice that they're not with it. And so that can be a major problem. And so what that made kind of an impetus for was we need something we can rely on. We need something standardized. We recognize that the kind of standard questions like where are you and uh, you know, who am I and who are you it's not, the answer is not always Batman. A lot of times they're able to easily answer those questions regardless of brain function. So the impetus was how can we create something that has some evidence to it? How can we create something that is standardized and we can go through it on a regular basis? That started with the sport concussion assessment tool uh, from the first international meeting on concussion sport in 2004. They then revised it uh, for the SCAT 2 in 2008. And then now we have the SCAT 3 and the child SCAT 3. Uh, there was a recognition that when you're looking at these younger and younger athletes that we're assessing concussions in, that sometimes these, if you have a, a seven-year-old or a 10-year-old, maybe those questions aren't appropriate for them. They're not gonna be able to answer them regardless. So that they developed the child SCAT-3 for uh, students between uh, five and 12, and then the SCAT-3 for 13 and over. And we'll go through that. So when you're looking at the SCAT-3 in terms of uh, uh, what, they're, what they're trying to uh, get at here is you're looking at evidence-supported components. So not just a matter of, yeah, we think this works, or yeah, um, my experience tells me that these questions work, but true evidence in terms of how uh, reliable these are. And you're uh, really looking at a number of different factors that go into this. So there's concussion symptom scoring, so the severity scales, the Likert scale of how bad are your symptoms. And we actually look at that in two different ways. How many total symptoms do you have? and what are the severity of your symptoms, and then your cognitive assessments, like the, um, the SAC and the Maddox questions, a true balance evaluation that's uh, in some fashion standardized, and we'll talk about that, the Glasgow Coma Scale, where you're looking for advanced injury, and then a true neuro exam. And the goal here is that you can not only have 
something that you can look at when you're seeing them on the sidelines, but can you do something beforehand? Because all the time you have the kids who will tell you, oh yeah, well my balance is off, but I have terrible balance. Uh, or you have uh, the, the kids in the football movies you see all the time who they say, you know, like, hold up three fingers. Well, coach, he wouldn't know that anyways, right? So, but there is some, there is some factor of knowing what a, a student athlete's baseline is prior to that. So if we have a standardized form here that we can go through this and assess their balance, assess their ability to do these cognitive tests beforehand, then it's going to be much more reliable on the sideline. So if you guys look at the, uh, the SCAT 3 form, if you guys want to follow along with as we go through this, this is, again, what's uh, kind of the standardized thing that we can follow through. Before you even get started, there's the idea of what if you have the person who's obvious like that. So there's a couple steps that they go through before you're even going to go through the trouble of this standardized formal evidence-based assessment. Let's see if there's something obvious. So number one, is there a glass coma scale, which is one of the first things you look at. Is it less than 15? If that's there... You don't have, you're not worried about concussion anymore. You're worried about uh, a more severe injury. Is there a deteriorating mental status? Have you already watched in just the time that it's taking you to set up? Have you already watched that person get worse? Then you don't have to worry about that. Potential spinal injury. If you're worried about a cervical uh, spine injury or any kind of spine injury based on the assessment, again, concussion is not your problem. Concussion is not your worry now. You have to assess that greater injury. And then certainly if you're having progressive, worsening symptoms, new neurologic signs as things go along, uh, you're going to move past that. And then beyond that, they say, okay, well, if you've passed that category of student, if you're still thinking concussion, here are some tools that you can say, I don't need this assessment. They have an obvious concussion. So any loss of consciousness, specifically how long? We heard Dr. O'Brien talk about this idea of a prolonged loss of consciousness, but the truth is is if they take a big hit and they're unconscious, you don't have to add up a bunch of points to tell you whether uh, you're going to put them back in the game or not. You already know the answer. If they have clear balance or motor in coordination, if they're kind of stumbling, uh, if they're having slow movements, sometimes the parents will see this uh, uh, before a coach will, or sometimes their teammates will come up uh, and talk to the coach or the trainer and say, ah, he's not keeping up with the plays, he's not making sense here. Confusion or disorientation in that same uh, aspect. We have, uh, 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 I have plenty of patients who come in who say, well, I didn't really notice it at the time, but I guess you know, one of my teammates went up to the trainers and said that I didn't understand the plays that were being called. I was running my routes wrong. Something that's, clear, uh, that's obvious that's showing you that. Uh, a loss of memory. If they don't remember what the injury was. Um, if, if, if they're trying to talk to you and they don't understand what happened or they're not really sure about it, they're asking questions about it, certainly you're going to be concerned without any need for a point system. And then that kind of blank stare. If they just come up and they're just sort of looking at you and they're clearly not with it, you don't need the points. Um, if they have a visible facial injury, which proves to you that they had some level of impact to the head, and there's an association with any of these other points, then you have to worry about concussion, right? If any of those are on their own, but then you have a clear facial injury that you know that there's a head injury, because sometimes you won't see it. Sometimes it's off the uh, a field, you didn't see that injury. Uh, certainly you don't see everything at, at, at all times. Again, that helps. So any of these, if you look on that scan three, it says if you have any of these, they should not be a return to play. Any of these symptoms, and they should not be a return to play that day. So then you get into the actual SCAT 3. Let's say you've passed all those categories and you've got this middle ground player. It's not the kid that clearly, clearly doesn't have a concussion. It's not the kid who clearly does have a concussion. We've got to try and figure it out. So they start off with this Glasgow Coma Scale. This is not designed for concussion. This is designed for moderate and severe head injury. So the first part of the SCAT 3 is one more step of trying to filter out the kids who, who need more attention than just a concussion. So it's an excellent, it's been proven to be an ex excellent predictor of outcome in moderate and severe brain injury. We're utilizing it in this fashion to try and uh, make sure that all we're dealing with is a much more mild uh, brain injury. The next step of it in the, in the uh, second section is the Maddox score. So uh, Maddox in 1995 uh, 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 created this uh, set of symptoms uh, to try and evaluate uh, cognition. Was there something that you could ask uh, athletes on a regular basis that would have some level of uh, uh, regulation to it and, and show you things? There's five different questions to score it. You either get it or you don't, and so there's a total of, uh, of five scores. You see the specificity is quite good between 86 and 100 percent. Sensitivity much more varied. Um, and uh, again, a very, a, a, 
really variable false positive rate, but the false negative rate is very low. So it's helpful to kind of say, boy, we have a, I have a very specific thing that if I can isolate this group here uh, and, and they're, um, they're able to perform this very well, it's unlikely that I'm missing some. Uh, but again, this is most helpful as part of a larger assessment. It's designed for sideline only. So uh, amongst the things that we say, let's get a baseline, let's do serial testing, it's been shown that this is not very helpful in the serial aspect of things, but just as a, a, as a greater part. In the SCAT 2, one of the changes between the SCAT 2 and the SCAT 3 was that with the SCAT 2, they were trying to create a score, right? We always want to handle. We always want to be able to take su such a subjective field like concussion and turn it objective. That's why the impact test is there. That's why the SCAT is there. We're trying to help ourselves with some sort of tool that we can follow. And so in the SCAT 2, they said, well, let's make it out of a score of 100. Let's combine all these things in these weird ways, uh, and then we can get a, have a score of 100, and then we can uh, feel better about the score. And one of the things they realized in looking at the evidence was, boy, combining all these together into one score actually doesn't make sense. There's no evidence to support that. As individual sections, there's uh, evidence here that they, these can be helpful. So in the SCAT 2, this wasn't actually included in the total score. In the SCAT 3, we don't really talk about the total score anymore because we found that uh, there's just not really evidence to support that. <laughs> The third section, you're moving along, and then it becomes the symptom assessment. So again, this is this uh, version of uh, having the student athlete themselves rank the severity of, of their symptoms. And this can be really helpful, again, as a baseline. If you have somebody who underlying has headache issues, uh, has issues with uh, focus and concentration, has a lot of these problems that we see that a hundred other things besides concussion can cause, it's sure good to know what their, if preseason their score is a 23, that's going to be helpful when you're trying to assess these things because the idea is post-concussion, you're trying to get them to their zero. And one of the most difficult things in assessing concussion, I'm sure anybody who uh, has gone through this understands that, is if you never had headaches before and then you get a concussion and you have headaches and then they go away, going from zero to headaches to zero, that's awful easy. If you have underlying headaches, if you have underlying anxiety, if you struggle with focus and concentration, to go from... Well, I was kind of having trouble, to now I'm really having trouble, to now I'm back to my previous level of difficulty with this thing, well, that's a tough line to draw. And so reaching that zero becomes very difficult, and that's the goal of trying to have some sense of baseline. So if you look at the symptom assessment and what their severities are, uh, a, sen a, a bit of a variable sens uh, sensitivity, but again, a very good specificity, 91 to 100 percent. And this is the most commonly used thing. This is the most commonly used uh, assessment post-concussion by, uh, this was in a, an athletic training journal, that it shows that this is uh, some version of a symptom scale is the most commonly used assessment. And it's fairly re reliable. So again, there's two ways of looking at this. It's how many symptoms do you have? Of these possible 22, how many do you have? And so the way they started scoring that on the, uh, on the SCAT 2 and SCAT 3 is if there's 22 possible, your score is 22 minus that number of symptoms. So the higher the score, the better you are. If you have, 22, if you have a score of 22, that means you have zero symptoms. You've marked off zero things. If you have a score of 10, that's a much bigger problem because you've marked off much more. I think what we use in the office in the post sideline, uh, uh, once we're kind of following these things, uh, uh, the aspect we use much more is what is your severity? Can we follow severity on a regular basis to show that their overall severity, zero to six on all of these, so a total possible score of 132, it, 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 the goal is we watch that number get lower and lower and lower as they uh, feel like they're getting better. Then the next section is true cognitive assessment. So uh, they go through this standardized assessment of concussion, which Dr. O'Brien reviewed, uh, and I'm going to go through it in a little bit uh, more detail. There's four scored components to this. There's an orientation to time. So uh, a zero, there's five questions about this. What month, what date, what day of the week, what year, and what time is it right now within the hour? And it's zero. You either get it or you don't, and a total of five possible points. Then they do word recall, the immediate. So on, on that SCAT 3, the benefit is that they give you four sets of words. You don't even have to make it up yourself. Uh, more importantly, you don't have to remember them yourself uh, and because it's already written down there for you. Uh, and if they start to memorize them, uh, I've had this happen where uh, I've told a student, I'm going to give you five words. And they go, apple, ta apple table, penny, bus, truck. 
Right, like they give you the words before you even give it to them. Okay, let's go to the next list then. Um, and so they'll, they'll, they can memorize this. So they give you uh, additional things. So that's the immediate word recall. Then you take them away from that and do concentration with the numbers of increasing length. Again, they give you alternate, alternate lists so that you can go through those numbers. Then you do the months in reverse order, December through January, which sometimes is difficult regardless of concussion. Uh, and again, sometimes helpful to have a baseline. Maybe they can't do it. Maybe the numbers thing, they can't do. If they have a specific learning disorder, they have dyslexia, and then you're trying to assess them post-concussion, that's not going to give you very much information if you don't have a baseline and they already have difficulty with that. And then after all of that, you come back and say, hey, what were those five words that I gave you? So again, uh, another score out of five. So if you look at the numbers for the uh, standardized assessment of concussion, it's been validated in a, in a whole host of studies with sensitivity anywhere between 80 to 94 percent, specificity between 76 and 91 percent. Uh, and this is, when you're looking at the reliability of this, you're talking about change from a baseline. That's the best way to view this because, again, it's not necessarily just a point in time, but how have they changed since this started. So if you're looking at two to four points drop in the overall score, being a significant one, then your reliability is somewhere between 42 and 71 percent. So uh, if you're looking at that, maybe not the best, but I think something that you can follow uh, on a regular basis that can be very helpful. And then it goes into a physical exam. So the fifth section is just a, a neck exam. Anytime you are assessing a concussion, if we know uh, through uh, what science and what uh, uh, Dr. Mann has already told us, we know that this is a uh, a acceleration, deceleration, twisting type force to the neck and head, then certainly we have to worry about cervical injury as well. So looking at that, looking at range of motion, tenderness, upper and lower limb sensation, sensation and strength again. This isn't for a concussion. This is making sure you don't have a cervical injury that you have to worry about as well. And then going through some level of a balance examination. So the initial, all the studies that we look at is the formal balance error scoring system, the BESS. That involves three positions on two different surfaces, a firm surface and a, a block of softer foam that requires greater balance. And plenty of studies have shown that the full BESS, the full balance error scoring system, is a very reliable tool and very helpful. But it's also not very easy to always have two different surfaces that you're going to do. So what people have created is the modified best, where you're just using a firm surface. And you're doing three positions. Each one's 20 seconds by your count. And you're figuring out what their dominant leg is so that you have them stand 20 seconds in a tandem gait with their feet together. Uh, 20 seconds where they have their dominant foot directly in front of their non-dominant in a line, and 20 seconds where they're standing on their non-dominant foot with their dominant foot storked up behind them. And they have their hands on their hips and their eyes closed, and you're looking for any errors, with errors being they have to open their eyes, they lose their balance, they can't hold a position for greater than five seconds, so it takes them greater than five seconds to get back in. Um, uh, and so you're trying to watch for, or if they have a, a swerve greater than 30 degrees, which I think is a harder thing to assess. Uh, but you're trying to look for that, again, something that's helpful to have uh, a baseline for to look at uh, if you're going to assess afterwards. Um, the other thing they talk about is this tandem gait, which is in the, in the SCAT 3. And what this is, is uh, you take uh, basically sports tape, uh, so they say 38 millimeters, that's what was in the study, um, because you're looking at the width of sports tape, and you do three meters out, and you have them walk in a tandem gait, heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe, three meters, 180 degree turn, walk back. They lose points, it's considered an error. If they don't do heel to toe, if they come off the uh, uh, tape, they don't understand the instructions, anything like that. You do time trials. The goal is to be able to complete that within 14 seconds, but you have them do time trials and have their uh, best time retained. I think it's something that's used certainly less frequently than the, the best, at least in our practice. And then a coordination exam is the seventh section where you're talking about um, uh, uh, really cerebellar signs, where you have them pick an arm, and they're doing finger to nose, and they do five times. They do full extension of the elbow, back. You have them do that. Uh, the, the goal is to have five times in less than four seconds. They either can do it or they can't. It's zero out of one points. So that's the, the eight section. The eighth section is going back to uh, what that word recall was. Okay, so there's the eight sections of your SCAT. So that's great. That's a collection of evidence-based abilities, standardized, that we can use. But it's just a tool. That is as good as we have. It is just a tool. They, they are very clear on the SCAT to say, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the front page, they say the SCAT 3 should not be used solely to make 
or exclude the diagnosis of, of concussion in the absence of clinical judgment. You have to understand that this is a moving target. We do not know all the time exactly what their symptoms are. They don't know what their symptoms are. What their symptoms are right now at the time of the hit and five minutes or 50 minutes or five hours or five days later can be so variable. And one of the, I think the most important points is our goal here is to be safe. The whole goal of all of this and all of this evidence is to safely keep a, a, a student athlete out of play and out of harm's way. So if they do great on this test, but you think as a medical provider in your assessment and based on what you know of that athlete or what your colleagues and the athletic trainers, the therapists or the coaches or the parents or anybody else, if you think that they might have a concussion, that is a trump card. That wins every time versus all of this evidence because we just cannot use anything greater that, that, that clinical impression is still the gold standard in the diagnosis of this. I want to briefly review Massachusetts laws in terms of clearance if we're going to talk about sideline assessment and bringing kids back. So uh, uh, this is all uh, brought out uh, February of 2012 uh, in terms of what the Massachusetts state's laws, all states are a little bit different in their laws. I think there's only uh, two states now, maybe now down to one state that don't have some version of concussion laws. So uh, one of the, the first ones that Massachusetts passed was that all students that are involved in extracurricular athletics have to provide a history of their concussion head and neck injuries. So they have to start off filling out a paper about their history. If they get a concussion throughout the year and it's not related to sports, they have to report it. It is on the student and the parents to report that so that there's an accurate history. Number two, any athlete that seems to be showing signs or symptoms of a concussion after a head injury has to be removed from the game. They are not allowed to return to play. If there's a, a, a fear of that, they have to be removed uh, and that they have to be formally evaluated by a medical uh, a provider of one of four different categories before they're able to return. Number three, that once they're talking about return, they have to follow a graduated return to play plan, which is fairly standardized and uh, CDC certainly has resources for that. Um, and that they have to be completely symptom free at rest prior to even beginning. Now the goal of that is the quick concussion, the kid who has two or three days of symptoms and then they get better and so now we can start and try and ease them up. It's a little bit harder when we're talking about these prolonged concussions. You and Dr. O'Brien talking about this idea of sub-threshold return to activity uh, exercise before they're completely better. And so sometimes that means that maybe I and my advancement over prolonged concussion get them to stage three or four before I return them to school and then they go to school and then they have to start their five days over, right? Where they have to, this uh, uh, five or six stage return to play, they have to start over. That may mean a couple of extra days, but certainly isn't a, uh, it's on a greater part of safety. And then effective this month, effective sept September 2013, any healthcare provider clearing a concussed athlete has to have documented department approved training in concussion. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can get that. We have uh, uh, an annual meeting on head and neck injury that qualifies for that. The CDC has online courses. There's a lot of opportunities that you guys can ha have for that if you're going to be a provider. But if you're going to be a part of this, the recognition is that this is not an easy job. And even me as a concussion uh, uh, expert or somebody who sees a lot of concussion, what I know is that I'm doing uh, my best to guess. I don't have a test. All I have is my clinical suspicion and the evidence of things that we have. But even then, without specific training, it's very difficult to assess these. Um, so these are, these are my references. Uh, you guys have some more uh, in, in the handouts, and uh, Dr. Crowder and myself will be available for questions after.